Brother Eric John Phelps, welcome to the broadcast here on this Lord's Day, this first day of the week, also called Sunday, on June the 16th, 2024. Welcome to the broadcast as I seek to have my morning message, my Sunday sermon for today. The topic is the sword of just defense in the context of government. Using the sword of just defense in conjunction with the government by which you are governed. Lest we be termed anarchists and revolutionists, we always must use the sword of just defense in resistance to papal tyranny, for all tyranny is papal, all of it. All tyranny is somehow connected to the Pope. And so when we resist satanic political tyranny, that is, backed by the Pope and inspired of Satan, there's a certain agenda we must follow if we are men of God, believing the Bible, having been saved by the grace of God. And that agenda that we must follow is given to us in Scripture, as well as true history. Remember the two most important subjects you can ever study are the Scriptures, the Word of God, the Reformation Bible in particular for English-speaking people, the AV 1611 in its present edition of 1769, which in certain places can be clarified and are to be clarified, all the while preaching and believing and teaching that it is the inspired and errant word of God for English-speaking people, an accurate translation of the underlying Greek and Hebrew texts that were directly inspired and promised to be preserved, every word, every jot, and every tittle. So hence, we have to begin with our final authority. We have to have, we saved Bible-believing people. I even hate to use the word Christian. It doesn't mean anything. It covers such a gamut of heretics and sinners that I, I just hate to use the term. It's not descriptive of us if we're saved. And so those of us who are born again have been baptized by the Spirit of God, placed in the body of Christ, sealed to the day of redemption, and now he is our master and our Lord, and we're doing his duty, doing our duty, we're doing his will and doing our duty every day. Our duty goes into the civil arena also. We are not to just go hide and pray and wait for the rapture or wait for the appearing of Christ. This gives the devil and his Roman papacy unlimited sway in imposing their political tyrannies that they seek to put upon us, especially us white men in Christ, because well, God used white men to break, break the temporal power of the Pope, another white man. As I've always taught, it's wicked white men versus righteous white men. This is the warfare, and those of the other races must decide who they're going to join. So we have to have our final authority, which is the Word of God. And in this instance, for English-speaking people, it's the AV 1611 Reformation English Bible, born out of the English Protestant Reformation, and thus this Bible is covered with blood. It took blood to get this Bible to us. The blood of many righteous men, including William Tyndall, that good and godly man, truly the father of the English Bible, the father of the AV 1611 Reformation English Bible, although he's not even mentioned in the uh, message to the translators. I find it intriguing. So, we have to have a final authority. The Christianity, quote-unquote, in this country today, in America, has no final authority. It is using these heretical, satanic, popish, papist Bibles that merely contain the Word of God, but are not the Word of God. 
Bibles, books like the NIV, the New American Standard, the American Standard, and a host of others, the English Revised Version, today's English Version, all of those books are popish heresies, and they have not the blessing of God upon them, evidenced by what's happened in the last hundred years. There's been no truly great awakening and moving of any nation that ever preached from any of those heretical documents. The great awakenings arise, and there's been four of them in this country, in America, through the preaching of the A.V. 1611 Reformation English Bible in its edition of 1769, right before the Lord established these Protestant and Baptist United States of America in 1789 when nine of the colonies ratified the Constitution and it went into effect. The country was not created in 1787, it was created in 1789. And so the backdrop of that is the Bible, the English Bible now is ready to go and the American people as well as the British people will be taking this English Bible to the ends of the earth, which will result in the British peoples having their British Empire upon which the sun would never set. They would take the English Reformation King James Bible to the ends of the earth with their military and with their merchants. And with that, then the AV 1611 was translated into some hundred different languages and dialects, bringing the word of God to the peoples and their languages as the evangelists, erroneously called missionaries, the evangelists would take the word of God then to their, all these different foreign nations of the brown people and the black people and the Asian people, and they would give them the Bible in their languages. Indeed, God has used the white men to do this. So, especially we white men, we need to wake up what's been done to us in America. And the first thing that's been done to us is we have been robbed of our Reformation Bible, coaxed into abandoning it for some, abandoning it for some book that calls itself the Bible. Now, when we return to the Reformation English Bible, you will begin to experience power in your living, in your preaching, in your thinking. More cogent thoughts will be in your minds. And you will gradually get stronger and stronger to the place where our forefathers were when they decided to resist the political papal tyranny of Rome in England, in Scotland, and in America particularly. And in these countries, the ones who led this were called the Puritans. Those horrible people, the Puritans. Without the Puritans, there is no Bible in our hands. A Puritan approached King James when he became King of England. And on his way into England, uh, John Reynolds approached him and says, We would like your authorization for another Bible. He was a Puritan. The Puritans are responsible for the English Reformation Bible that's gone to the ends of the earth for the last 400 years or so. So if you don't like the Puritans, you're in sin, and you need to confess your sin, and your bigotry, and your hatred based upon the lies that these papist instructors have told to you. The classic work on the Puritans is Neil. Neil and the Puritans. It's a three-volume set. And so... I want to now go step by step with you using some scriptures as backing, as the foundation for what I'm to teach you today. The typical cowardly Arminian American Christian is going to attack you when you decide to resist tyranny, when you decide to desire to resist injustice. They're going to say, you need to turn the other cheek. I had a gentleman say that to me. He purports to be a Christian, and he has long hair. He's of a Hispanic descent, and he thinks he knows a lot, very kind of self-centered. And we had a little discussion, and uh, he told me that I need to turn the cheek in a certain matter that arose. And I said, no, I'm not to. I'm to openly confront this gentleman for what he is doing well, you need to turn the other cheek. If I were you, Eric, I wouldn't do it. It was an individual in the gym that was being a loud mouth, and I was just uh, sick of it, and I thought I would speak to him about it. 
And I told this gentleman that this is what I was going to do. And you know, I wouldn't do it. You need to turn the other cheek. Well, I didn't. And I spoke to the gym owner and got it resolved. If it wasn't going to get resolved through the gym owner, then I'd resolve it. So you have to resist encroachments of tyranny in your life, whether it be individual or whether it be on a governmental scale or whether it be on a racial scale. We whites are under absolute racial attack every day by this emergency war powers military government and its corporations using the blacks that will oppress us to rob us, to rape us, and to kill us every day in America. And those are facts that are not to be spoken of by the typical uh, news outlets of these pundits whether it be on the right with Fox or on the left with MSNBC. It doesn't matter. They're all Catholics. They're all Papists. And they're all part of the Jesuit design to destroy historic white Anglo-Saxon Protestant and Baptist America. If you're white, you're a target. If you're a Protestant, you're a target. If you're a Baptist, you're a target. And if you're a Calvinist, you're really a target because the Puritans who were Calvinists used the sword of just defense to set back the papacy on a thousand battlefields. But it would have never happened had they not had a final authority. Had they not had a Bible that they believed in their own language of English was the Word of God, that it was inspired indirectly, though, as a translation from the directly inspired, yet still inspired. So they had a final authority. That's what we need to revert back to. We Bible-believing men of God need to go back to the AV 1611 Reformation English Bible and its underlying texts. Greek and Hebrew text. Well, you got a little Aramaic and Old Testament, but they're just letters during the Persian Empire. So it's Hebrew and Greek, Koine Greek. And it's the Greek text known as the Textus Receptus, not any other text. Indeed, the Bible believing man of God called to preach as a preacher is to be an example not only of faith but an example of courage, an example of confronting evil, whether it's within his own church, whether it's within his community, whether it's within his own government. He is an example of confronting evil, and he doesn't back down. Those are the preachers that inspired the men to give us the political liberty, or what's left of it, that we have today in America. Without those kinds of preachers, there is no political liberty. And thus, we need to do a little review. We know in the book of Proverbs, the Bible teaches us that the fear of man is the bringeth a snare. The fear of man bringeth a snare. It's a trap. If you fear man, you're going to get trapped into something. You're going to do something that you shouldn't do. You're going to sin. The fear of man brings sin into your life. But whosoever trusteth in the Lord, he shall be safe. So in the midst of your conflict, when you decide to trust in the Lord rather than fear man, you're going to be safe. The Lord's going to get you through it. But you have to decide in that moment, I will not fear this guy. I'm not afraid of him, and I will trust the Lord to resist him or her. Because there's a lot of wicked women out there now, these feminists with their big loud mouths, and they think they're all equal to men, and they can beat up men. These wicked, wicked feminists, you got to stand up to them too. Of course, now when you stand up to these female feminists, you're going to be called a sexist. When you stand up to these majority savage blacks that hate you because you're white, you're going to be called a racist. And when you stand up to the papists and these other satanic religions that hate you, you're going to be called a bigot. Well, that's fine. That's fine. Remember, all tags are either going to drop off or burn off. At the appearing of Christ, when we're taken out of this world, all these tags that we've been tagged with are going to drop off. And those that are not saved, that all the tags that they have, they're all going to burn off in the lake of fire for eternity. All tags are either going to drop off or burn off.
And so, just so long as you're pleasing the Lord and doing what's pleasing to Him, who cares what tags they give you? Conspiracy theorist, bigot, you name it. Jesus Christ was a bigot. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. A bigotry is that you, you do something one way. It has nothing to do with hatred. A bigot is one-minded. A sexist, someone who recognized the differences between the two sexes. And states that a woman has her place and a man has his place. And a woman is to dress a certain way and a man is to dress a certain way. And a woman is to have long hair and a man is to have short hair. Because <clears throat> does not nature teach us that long hair on a man is a shame unto him, as 1 Corinthians 11 tells us? We're to have distinctions between us. And they're going to call you sexist for that, for preaching that. If you don't go along with unisex or the Pope, why, you're some sort of a sinner. All these women got the skin tight jeans on, the man got the jeans on. Woman's got the tattoos, he's got the tattoos. She's got the piercings, he got the piercings. What's the difference? The only difference is genitalia. And what the real difference is, it goes right to the brain. A woman's brain is different than a man's brain. Can't change that, can we? When you start standing up against this wickedness, this sexual wickedness, you're going to be called a sexist. And when you stand up against the black savagery that's everywhere and denounce it, you're going to be called a, a racist. And a racist is merely someone who distinguishes between the races. It has nothing to do with hate. So, if you say there's only one way to heaven, you're a bigot. If you distinguish between the races, that they're different, that we're not all the same, why, you're then a racist. And if you Distinguish between male and female, men and women, that they each have their different roles while you're a sexist. So they're going to give, they're going to do something to try to make people not listen to you. Because that's what they've done to me. But that's okay. Just keep preaching the Word of God, living it, reading the AV 1611, getting your power from God, and setting forth in the power of the Spirit of God to do His will every day. So, <clears throat> in our topic of today the sword of just defense in the hand of government, I want to first denounce this heresy that we Bible-believing men of God are to turn the other cheek. That's heresy. That was taught by the Messiah, the Son of Man. Son of Man is a Messianic term. It has nothing to do with the church. It's in Daniel chapter 7. Son of Man is always a title that Christ used many, many times of himself in relation to Israel, not the church, not the body of Christ. And by the way, Israel is not the church, and the church is not the body of Christ. Or pardon me, Israel is not the church, and the church is not Israel. Two separate peoples in two separate economies called dispensations, in existing in two separate ages, periods of time. A dispensation, a stewardship, an economy is the household rule for the age in which this particular dispensation is. Age is a period of time. So we distinguish. We distinguish between ages. We distinguish between Israel and the church. Without discrimination, without distinguishing, it's insanity. And so, as we read Matthew chapter 5, as the Lord is speaking from his sermon on the mount that he is preaching to the nation of Israel, the church is not in Matthew chapter 5. It does not exist. And the maxims for it do not apply to the church because they're in direct contradiction, as we read in the writings of the Spirit of God, as he used the Apostle Paul in 14 epistles in the New Testament, from Romans to Hebrews. So we see here in Romans, in Matthew chapter 5, we see, But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, Whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If you do that in this present evil age, you will be beaten to a pulp. That doesn't work. 
in the present evil age that we live in of Galatians 1.4. Present evil world, more cl in clarifying that word, is the present evil age. It's not for us. What is for us then? We read in Romans chapter 12, verse 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Is it possible for you to live peaceably with the man that comes up to you and smash, smashes you across the face? It's not possible. It's not possible to live peaceably with him. And so you better fight back. Or you will be deemed a coward. And you will be a coward. Many a coward has used that verse in Matthew 5, turn the other cheek, to cover up his cowardice. Well, no, that's not the way it is here now in the dispensation of grace. Ephesians 3, during this present evil age, Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. We are to live peaceably with all men as much as possible, but when it's not possible, then we have to confront them, or then we have to fight back. And to what extent do we fight back? Well, we read in the book of Hebrews, unto blood, if necessary. In Hebrews chapter 12, we read, Hebrews is the last epistle that the Lord used the Apostle Paul to write. Yes, we know who wrote Hebrews, and it's the Apostle Paul. So as we read in Hebrews 12, verse 4, we read, Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and he is faulting them for this. He's faulting these Hebrew believers in Messiah. That they have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And of course that means their blood in resisting sin. But it also means the opposer's blood. That's correct. We're going to shed his blood also in striving against sin. If necessary. Because remember, any confrontation can go physical and ultimately mortal. And you've got to be ready for it. When you're confronting someone about sin or what's been done, you've got to be ready for them to take a swing at you or maybe pull a knife on you or whatever. And you've got to be ready to go to the distance. Over something little, well, yes, you're resisting sin. But they, they magnified it, so you've got to be willing to go there too. That's why I recommend all Bible-believing white Christian, Bible-believing men take some uh, uh, military discipline, learn how to shoot, learn how to use a knife, learn how to fight. Bible-believing white men should know how to fight. And we should like it. It's good to know how to fight. It's righteous to know how to fight. I don't want to fight, but I know how to if I have to. Bible-believing, born-again men of God should know how to fight. We should probably all be members of a certain fight club, a Christian fight club, where we learn how to grapple and, and wrestle or box or some uh, martial art of some sort. Not invoking the demons, of course, like, like all the high gung fu masters and all those other guys, but no, just learn how to fight. Learn the confidence that you'll have when you know how to fight it when you have to resist evil unto blood, striving against sin. That's what we need to do. That's what we should do. We are not cowards. We do not run from a confrontation. We need to be predictable that if we are abused, we're going to deal with it. I was abused by two TSA people at the airport. I got rid of them. One was a white, big white guy, another was a Hispanic guy. Complained about it to the people, to the supervisor in charge there. She gave me the number to write the letter to, to call them, write the letter, wrote the letter, and they're gone. Did the same thing with a guy down there at the prothonotary. He was arrogant with me, and so I wrote a letter of complaint, recommended he reprimanded. He's not there anymore that I can see. you got to deal with these people, and you got to get rid of them. And you get rid of them through the pen and writing letters to their supervisors or whoever. 
And if it takes you time to do it, I got rid of another black guy down there in the airport down in Philadelphia. He was very rude to me. I wrote a long letter to the head of Delta. Haven't seen him since. You got to get rid of these people when they're are they affrontery to you, when they insult you, when they don't do their job. You got to confront them on it and just say, "Oh, don't say what. Um, it's not going to happen. They're going to do it to somebody else after you." Resist them. Stand right up to them. You're right. They're wrong. We're resisting unto blood, striving against sin, no matter what the context is. That's Christian. That's Bible. That's Protestant. That's Baptist. And of course, that's Calvinistic. So, we do not turn the other cheek. As much as lieth within us, we are at peace with all men. I want to be at peace with my neighbors. But when my neighbor offends me, I'm going to go see him. And I did that just recently. My neighbor had his pit bull running around, came into my yard, grounding me. I said, well, you know, I can either kill this dog here or go talk to him. I'll go talk to the neighbor. I t yelled at the dog. The dog ran, ran off. And I went and talked to her. I said, would you please tie up your dog so it doesn't run in my yard? And it hasn't been back since. But if I wouldn't have done anything and say, oh, look how terrible that is, the dog would be back, ground at me, and then I, who knows what would happen. Because I'm not going to tolerate a pit bull coming to my property and ground at me and threatening me because I'm going to shoot it. So I just gave the, the neighbor a little grace here. I didn't know it was her dog. I went up and talked with her. And now I don't have a problem. In Arkansas, if a dog comes on your property, it's a strange dog, everybody shoots him. And I don't have a problem with that. Dog should be under the under the lead under the <laughs> tutorship of its owner. If it's not, man, it's it's if it's running around on your property and you don't know what's going on, you don't know if that dog's gonna bite you or what. You ever been bitten by a dog? I was bit by a German shepherd. And it didn't hurt. And it hurt. Put puncture marks in my legs. Had to have shots. The dog had to be quarantined. And, you know, you got, you've got to resist under blood, striving against sin. And that is the Bible-believing way. That's the way that we got Western civilization. Now, we're not afraid of man. We fear God. I'm afraid of God. Somebody say, oh, perfect love casts out all fear. Not when it comes to God. Fear God. 1 Peter chapter 2. Honor the king. Fear God. Love the brotherhood. We are to fear God. Do you fear God, my brother in Christ? Are you afraid of him when it comes to doing evil? Do you have a holy reverence for him and a fear of him and his magnificent, august majesty of who he is? If we don't have a healthy fear of God... We are not going to be restrained from the wickedness and evil in our hearts that wants to commit sin every day. Because remember, we're all sick. We're all sick in sin. We have a disease called sin. We inherit it from our mother and our father. And the only one who didn't have that disease was Adam when he was first created. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, who was virgin born, he didn't have that sin in his members, and if he wouldn't have gone to the cross, he'd be alive today because he had eternal life in himself. As we read in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And if your Bible doesn't say God, take that thing and put it to your heresy shelf. And right over the face of it, on the first page, heresy. So, <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ was very God manifest in the flesh. He had two natures. He was very man. He had the nature of man. He was just as much a man as Adam was. And he was very God. He had the nature of God and that is the pre-incarnate Son of God. The eternal Son of God. Second person of the Godhead indwelled his body. A body has thou prepared me, O oh my God. Hebrews chapter 10. I delight to do thy will. So, <clears throat> what we do then is, as men of God, we do not countenance political tyranny. Oh, now you're, now you're meddling. Now, that's right, I'm meddling. It's a disgrace 
what these preachers in this country have put up with for the last 90 years and their the Jesuits have taken over this country with Proclamation 2040 of March 9th, 1933 and the Emergency Banking Relief Act declared to be passed in the House and then in the Senate by that Henry T. Rainey, that wicked sinner, that Knight of Pythias, that member of the Independent Order of the Odd Fellows, that Speaker of the House, working for the Jesuits and the devil, just validating all the New Deal sin going on in that House of Representatives in the 30s. And the preachers never rose up and said, what's this Henry Rainey doing? What's this FDR doing? shoving this communism down our throats, taking our gold from us. What in the name of Jesus Christ are they doing? There should have been a total preaching and revolt among the Protestant preachers the moment this started to happen. There should have been angry, a righteous indignation. You're stealing our gold that we mined, we coined. It's our money, it's public money. You're taking it from us under the guise of necessity because we had a Great Depression caused by the Pope and Joseph Kennedy, huh? And his Federal Reserve Bank, the Federal Reserve taking 40% of credit out of circulation, making sure we're going to break this heretic and liberal American people and then and shackle them with this emergency war powers military government and their ad infinitum three-letter agencies to afflict you and persecute you and they're all carrying guns. Why, why are you putting up with it, you preachers? i tell you why. Because you're cowards. You're afraid to die. And if you're afraid to die, how can you say you're saved? It's not the Bible teaches to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's not the greatest service anybody can do to us is kill us. The Lord will take care of them for that murder. But that's a blessing for us. We're going to be with Jesus Christ. And we died in righteous resistance and indignation to sin. What better way to go? So, that's what we do. That's what our ancestors did. Resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Now, I want to give you an example. I want to read certain portions to you in John Knox's History of the Reformation in Scotland. And I want you to remember this man, John Knox. John Knox is the man who made Scotland great. And I want you to know what he did in Scotland as the great Scottish reformer and really the foremost leader of the Presbyterian Church. Because Presbyterians have always had a history of resisting tyranny unto death. They don't do it today. They're a bunch of sissified, Bible perverters, perversion readers. They have no power, and their Calvinism is not the Calvinism of John Calvin. It's not the Calvinism of the previous centuries. It's an effeminate, tolerant, cheek-turning Calvinism, which is not Calvinism. Calvin's College is heretical. So, let's take a look at this wonderful man named John Knox. We read in page, on page 278 of the Knox's History of the Reformation in Scotland, and we're going to read concerning Knox's first interview with the Roman Catholic Papist bigot Mary. Mary, Queen of Scots. This is not Bloody Mary. This is Mary, Queen of Scots. She's a steward. Bloody Mary is a tutor. So this concerns Mary, Queen of Scots. When she decided to kill the Protestants or the heretics under the, under the leadership of the priests in Scotland. Okay. Later, this little witch is going to have her head cut off thanks to Elizabeth under the exhortation of uh, William Cecil, that she's going to be put to death and rightfully so for conspiring to kill Elizabeth with the priests and become queen in England. She was a wicked, evil, sinful, ungodly papist who hated the truth, who hated Jesus Christ, who hated the Bible, and who hated the Protestants, Presbyterians, and she hated John Knox. And Knox knew it. But I want you to see the, the courage of John Knox in the face of political 
bigotry and hatred, which is exactly what we white men are experiencing here today in America at the hand of that white Roman Catholic bigot Joe Biden, who is no idiot. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he's under the complete control of the Jesuit priests. One of them being Leo J. O'Donovan, who was at Biden's inauguration and had a little prayer for him. So we read here on page 278, John Knox. Here is what he says. As he's speaking to Queen Mary, Queen Mary says, Think ye that subjects having the power may resist their princes? Do you think, Mr. Knox, that the subjects have the power to resist, their, resist the princes who are their sovereign lords and masters? Because there's no such thing as the sovereignty of the people at this time. The people are subjects. The sovereign is the king or the queen. Queen Mary in this position. Mary, Queen of Scots. Here's John Knox. If their princes exceed their bounds, madam, no doubt they may be resisted even by power. I will read that again. If their princes, Joe Biden, exceed their bounds, persecute us by a host of different means, Madam, seek to take our guns, or take our guns, which is persecution, Madam, no doubt they may be resisted even by power. That's right. They can resist you. They can resist this power in the government. For there is neither greater honor nor greater obedience to be given to kings or princes than God hath commanded to be given unto father and mother. But the father may be stricken with a frenzy in which he would slay his children. If the children arise, join themselves together, apprehend the father, take the sword from him, bind his hands, and keep him in prison till his frenzy be overpassed. Think ye, madam, that the children do any wrong? It is even so, madam, with princes that would murder the children of God that are subjects unto them. Their blind zeal is nothing but a very mad frenzy, and therefore to take the sword from them and bind their hands, and to cast them into prison, till they be brought to a more sober mind, is no disobedience against princes, but just obedience, because it agreeth with the will of God. That's your right, defended by Knox, to resist political tyranny. This is Bible, and this Bible doctrine was championed by the Puritan Calvinists whether they be Presbyterians or Baptists or Anglicans, they were Puritans and they were Calvinistic and they resisted unto blood striving against sin as Knox recommended and defended. Well, how could he do this? Well, one reason is John Knox read the scriptures. Remember, John Knox baptized the man who would be King James, the authorizer of our Bible. John Knox baptized him. And so we read in this book on page 304, this confrontation of Knox with the Queen again. This is his second interview with Mary, Queen of Scots, the fanatical papist that hated Knox and viewed him as a threat to her political power. We read here on page uh, 304, the Queen looked about to some of the reporters and said, Your words are sharp enough as ye have spoken them, but yet they were told to me in another manner. I know that, that my uncles and you are not of one religion. Well, the uncles were Roman Catholic, and therefore I cannot blame you, albeit you have no good opinion of them. But if you hear anything of myself that mislikes you, come to myself and tell me, and I shall hear you. So she's appearing to be benevolent. That's, tyrants always pull that card. 
when they're plotting to kill you, they're on their open the face, they're being benevolent. They're two-faced. Knox replies, Madam, he quoteth, quoteth he, I am assured that your uncles are enemies of God. Now here is John Knox telling the most powerful individual in Scotland, the Queen, that your enemies are the enemies of God. Where's the preacher that's going to say to Joe Biden, you're an enemy of God to his face and in his presence? Or that your sons are enemies of God to his face and in his presence? That's what a preacher does. I am assured that your uncles are enemies of God and unto his son Jesus Christ. <laughs> and that for maintenance of their own pomp, they spare not to spill the blood of many innocents. What did, what did Knox mean by that? On well, the footnote here, the, uh, the gentleman writes of this, Knox here alludes to the massacre of Protestants by the Duke of Guise and the Cardinal of Lorraine at the castle of Ambrose, of which Mary, Queen of Scots, had been an eyewitness. She watched the murder of all these Protestants. She saw it and approved it and lauded it and was looking forward to the moment where she could have it the same thing done to John Knox. But you know what? John Knox has a special power upon him. He has a special protection upon him from God. And that's how God rewarded him for stepping out in faith and being courageous by faith to stand against this political absolutism and sin of this woman queen, of this little tyrant, of this little wench. Okay? He goes on, he says, Therefore I am assured that their enterprises shall have no better success than others have had that before them have done what they do now. But could to your grace's contentment, provided I exceed not the bounds of my vocation, vocation, I am called, madam, to a public function within the church of God and am appointed by God to rebuke the sins and vices of all. That's what a preacher does. He rebukes the sins and the vices of all, including the political leaders. And you expose their membership in secret societies. You expose what they've done. Chucky e. Schumer, you were a hand in the murder of the Branch Davidians. That's what you had a hand in. The preacher should confront him to his, his infidel Jewish face and confront him with his sin, this Jew that's betraying his own Hebrew, Jewish, Israelitish people. Yeah. Servant of the Pope and the Archbishop of New York City. That's what the preacher ought to say too. You're a servant of the Archbishop of New York City, Chuck Schumer. Just like Joe Biden and the others. Because the Archbishop of New York City is the most powerful prince of the church in this country. Oversees all the big New York banks, the Federal Reserve Bank, New York, overseen by the Archbishop of New York City. Where's the preacher putting his finger in the face of the Archbishop, which he ought to be doing? We go on. As I said, I am appointed by God to rebuke the sins and vices of all. I am not appointed to come to every man in particular to show him his offense, for that would be, for that labor were infinite. If your grace please to frequent the public sermons, then doubt I not, but you shall fully understand both what I like and mislike, as well as in your majesty, as in all others. I'm going to tell you about your sin, as I do all others from the pulpit. Or, if your grace will assign unto me a certain day and hour when it will please you to hear the substance of the doctrine which I have proposed in public in the churches of this realm, I will most gladly await upon your grace's pleasure, time and place. But to wait upon your chamber door 
and then to have no further liberty but to whisper my mind in your grace's ear, or to tell you what others think and speak of you, neither will my conscience nor the vocation whereunto God hath called me suffer it. I can't do that, and I'm not going to do it. I'd be a coward. For albeit at your grace's commandment I am here now, yet can I not tell what other men shall judge of me, that at that time of day am absent from my book, and waiting upon the court. Think of the queen that says, you will not always be at your book. Oh, I hate that Bible. You're not always going to be at that book. At this time, I believe he's using the Geneva Bible, this time. Maybe not. Knox hasn't fled to Geneva yet. Maybe Knox is back from Geneva. I can't quite remember, but he's reading an English Bible, okay, from the Texas Receptus. You will not always be at your book, said the queen. And so turned her back. We're turning to turn her back on him. We're going to get prissy here. The said John Knox departed with a reasonable merry countenance. So he just like, kind of laughs. He has, puts a smile on his face, turns around, and walks away. <laughs> Whereat some papists, these are the fanatical Roman Catholics in the court, called the papists, offended, said, He is not afraid. He is not afraid. He is not afraid of the queen and her fury against him, wanting to kill all the Protestants in the land of Scotland. He is not afraid. Which being heard of him, he answered, quote, Why should the pleasing face of a gentlewoman affray me? Make me afraid. <laughs> I have looked in the faces of many angry men, and yet have not been afraid above measure. And so left he, the queen, and the court for that time." Unquote. This is John Knox. He's not afraid of man. He's not afraid of the queen. He's not afraid of the levelers when he was in Geneva. The levelers were the communists of his day, and they wanted to have communion with everybody else. And Knox says, you're not having communion. I'm not giving you communion. And when he refused communion to these sinners, these levelers, uh, that really distinguished him with his courage. Because, no, you're not having it here. He wasn't afraid of those wicked men. And he's definitely not afraid of some good-looking woman who happens to be queen in her pretty face. And he can smile in the face of this threat to his life. Remember, John Knox was threatened. John Knox was sent to the galleys for a while. John Knox suffered for what he did. And in conclusion, I want to read this author's footnote of Knox and the Puritans. We read this footnote on page 270 of this tremendous work. John Knox on the History of the Reformation in Scotland, page 270. It's a footnote. Whatever was the cause the Calvinists were the only fighting Protestants. It was they whose faith gave them courage to stand up for the Reformation. In England, Scotland, France, Holland, they and they only did the work. And but for them, the Reformation would have been crushed. This is why I admire them and feel there was something in their creed that made them what they were. I entirely agree with Knox in his horror of that one mass. If it had not been for Calvinists, Huguenots, Puritans, and whatever you like to call them, the Pope and Philip, with the Jesuits I would add, would have won we should be either we would eat we we should and we should be either papists or socialists socialists is the brainchild of the papacy 
Fabian socialism in England later on is the brainchild of the Jesuits running the laborers, British labor, and ultimately the Fabian socialists. And later it's going to be labor Zionism. That's all papal. It's all papist. Socialism is wicked. And the big backers of socialism are always rich. They're always the cartel capitalists, like Lawrence O'Donnell of MSNBC, that a fanatical Irish Catholic. He's a socialist, but he's a multimillionaire. If it wasn't for them, those Calvinists, we should either be papists or socialists. They took up the sword of just defense, and they fought for the Reformation. They fought for their ancient liberties. They fought for us, white men, in America today, Protestants and Baptists, as well as you black men that have joined us and realize you must help us if you're going to have any liberty because you can't do it. You've never done it. And there's no record of history of any black Protestants ever successfully resisting the papacy except the, Pro the Coptics in Ethiopia when Ethiopia expelled the Jesuits in 1682. Other than that, there's no record of any black people of any nation standing against the Pope's white power structure and his Jesuits, securing for themselves political liberty. Never has happened. So you guys got to join us. You got to help us, white men. If you want personal liberty, if you don't want to go to the FEMA death camps when the new right comes to power run by the Pope. So this is Calvinism. This is bearing the sword of just offense under the shedding of their blood, which is biblical, and it's done from a position of being in government, which is my next point. So you have, first of all, the Word of God circulating among the people in their own language, accursed by the Council of Trent of the Jesuits. Accursed be the Bible in the common tongue of the vulgar. They don't want that. Because that makes people, they're getting saved and they have power to resist political tyranny. The Bible is the greatest power in resisting political tyranny. Why do you think the Jesuits who ran the USSR prohibited the Bible from being read by those Russian people? Huh? Why do you think Western white men were smuggling the Bibles into Russia for since the Bolshevik Revolution until, what, 1990? Why do you think they were doing that? Because that USSR, Jesuit government, wouldn't allow its circulation because the Jesuits ran the USSR like they do run the Russian Federation today. Putin is as much in the hands of the Jesuits as was Stalin, as is, Bo as is Biden. They all work together. Time we white Bible-believing men woke up. They work together. The intelligence communities work together under the power of the Jesuit order. There's no them and us. The only them is all these papists and servants of the papacy, and us are the Bible-believing born-again men of God with the Spirit of God indwelling us. That's the, that's the only them and us. And so you have the Bible. It affects the people. The people then begin to have clean lives, and they get sent out of their lives, and they start praying to be delivered from this tyranny. And so the Lord raises up political leaders to do it. This is exactly what happened in the English Puritan Revolution. There was a great awakening in England. They would preach on soapboxes. The people were getting saved. The Puritans were waxing more powerful. They got into the House of Commons. They went into the arm of government. And in the House of Commons is where they put in their remonstrances, the great remonstrance of some 190 different complaints. One of them was that the King Charles I had moved the Admiralty on land, which is effectively what they've done here in America. And so this resulted in the Puritan Revolution that would last for 10 years. And after 10 years, God blessed it, and they won in the person of Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell would rule Great Britain for five years as the protector of the Protestant faith. And... Uh, he would be the protector of the Protestant faith, and he would rule England as though he was a king, but he wasn't because he was protecting and, and, and he was defender of the faith, protector of the commonwealth and defender of the faith, and he defended it for five years till the Jesuits poisoned him. 
But England prospered immensely, and the fame of Englishmen spread around the world, and to be an English citizen or a subject was a great honor during the Cromwell Commonwealth of England. That's, the, that's how it works. Bible, preachers, people, then we have leaders, leaders obeying God, they're reading his word, that God gives them victory in battle, and then we have political liberty. That's how it happens. That's got to be what happens here in America if we are ever to have political liberty again. Now, I want to read to you a letter that was sent to me. I received it a few days ago. When I read it, I was utterly shocked. It was wonderful, and so I want to read it to you now. The author of this pamphlet, maybe I should say, or flyer, his name is Daniel Nowak. Daniel Nowak. Hey, Brother Daniel, thank you for this. And so I'm going to read all of this right into this broadcast today. And he hits the nail perfectly on the head, what needs to be done here in America. Title, Restoring the Constitutional Republic of the United States of America. Now, the Constitutional Republic is still here, but what he really means, restoring the constitutional government, the civilian government of the Republic of America, because we've been under military government for 91 years, since March 9, 1933. So here's what he says. Withdraw U.S. membership from the United Nations by having the U.S. Congress pass the American Sovereignty Restoration Act. Within one year of passage and implementation of this act, the United States would be totally free of all United Nations legal proceedings, regulations, rules, and treaties that bind member nation states. Also, the United Nations Worldwide Office Headquarters located in New York City would be closed down and required to find a new location elsewhere outside of the United States. The United Nations is nothing but sin. It's always been sin. The John Birch Society has always denounced it as evil and wicked, and we should not be a part of it. And one of their sayings was, get, out of, get us out of the UN. Well, of course, the UN's wicked. The Pope's got an honorable seat at the UN. Why we ever have anything to do with him? Why we ever let him tell us anything to do? Who does he think he is, having the right to rule our government? Huh? The doctrine of temporal power. What an effrontery to Jesus Christ and an insult to those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a right to rule our own country without anybody else telling us what to do or putting foreigners up to rule our country for us, as was done in Russia during the USSR because Stalin was not a Russian, as they did in Germany during the Nazi regime because Hitler was not a German. He was an Austrian. The Jesuits love putting foreigner foreigners up to rule over other people. So he goes on. Closed down all 29 Jesuit colleges and universities and 63 Jesuit secondary schools located throughout the country and bam, expel the Society of Jesus, Jesuit order, from the United States. Amen and glory to God. Examples of these universities, Boston College, Fordham, Georgetown, John Carroll, Loyola of Chicago, Marquette, Santa Clara, St. Louis, University of San Francisco, to name a few, I would add. Next, immediately sever all diplomatic relations, ties with the Vatican by recalling back home the U.S. ambassador to the Vatican from Rome, Italy. Amen. That only started with Ronald Reagan, you know, in 1984, when we have a formal ambassador to, the, to Rome. That wicked sinner, that knight of Malta, Ronald Reagan, that coward, that communist, that gun grabber, and all the white people think he's some sort of a great conservative, make America great again. Reagan started that, not Trump. Reagan started that. And he lets all these alien invaders here because of complete and total amnesty. What's wrong with you white men? I was almost mobbed in a church one time. I was preaching that when I denounced Ronald Reagan. All these older white men got furious with me. I said, what's wrong with you? Going on. Immediately sever. All diplomatic... I, meant, I, re I read that. From Rome, Italy. Close down the Vatican Embassy office located in Washington, D.C. That's where the papal nuncio is there on behalf of the Pope. The papal nuncio tells the president what to do. That's right, uh, Joey. Uh, you're going to do this today. Okay. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. And, ex and expel the Vatican ambassador to the United States, the papal nuncio, Cardinal Christopher Pierre, P-I-E-R-R-E. -E. He's got to go. From the country, have the U.S. Congress reinstate the 1867 ban on funding all future diplomatic relations to the Vatican. That's right. 
1867, they kicked out the Vatican ambassador here. They would not allow that to happen after the Jesuits killed Lincoln, and that's why that happened in 1867. That's after the John Surratt trial where he was released, and so as a result, the government cut off all diplomatic relationship with the Vatican, and it should have stayed that way. On funding the future diplomatic missions to the Vatican, finally closed down the St. John Paul II National Shrine, sponsored by the Knights of Columbus, located in Washington, D.C. Of course, going to close down that, that idolatry, that, that temple to the devil. St. John Paul II. St. John Paul Paul II, the man who sold Zyklon B gas from IG Farman to the Nazis. I mean, come on. William Cooper did a good job in exposing that in his book, Behold the Pale Horse. He also spoke of it on this many broadcasts before they killed him. Going on. Outlaw shut down all secret societies operating inside the United States. All government officials, local, state, and federal, that are members of any secret society must publicly renounce their membership and disavow their oaths to any secret group they belong to and repledge their allegiance and oath to the U.S. Constitution and the office they currently hold under a civilian government. Because there ain't going to be no more military government. Next, close down the Council on Form or Examples, Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks, Bohemian Grove, Freemasonry, Knights of Columbus, Knights of Malta, Loyal Order of the Moose, Opus Dei, Skull and Bones, etc. That's right. That's right, my brother. That's right, brother Daniel. Preach it. Next, close down the Council on Foreign Relations Worldwide Office Headquarters located in New York City and its two secondary offices in Washington, D.C. The Trilateral Commission's North American Regional Group Office Headquarters, located in Washington, D.C., and the Chicago Council of Global Affairs Office Headquarters, located in Chicago, Illinois, and its secondary office in Washington, D.C. Amen. Shut them all down. John Birch Society was calling for that for years. Shut down the Council on Foreign Relations. But you see, the Jesuits run the John Birch Society, and that's why they never got anywhere. John McManus was a good Catholic. Uh, uh, the guy who uh, set up, had, had a hand in setting up the uh, John Birch Society, Robert Welch, was a apostate Protestant 32nd degree Freemason, according to Dr. Stuart Crane, who was a great history teacher at Bob Jones University. No, no, got to get rid of it. They all got to go. Next. Repeal both the National Banking Acts of 1863 and 1864, that was for Lincoln here now, put upon us by the radical Red Republicans, and all amendments, and the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, and all amendments that was put, on, put upon us by the Jesuits using their cowardly, apostate Presbyterian Woodrow Wilson, when on December 23rd, he signs the Federal Reserve Act into law, when there wasn't even a, a quorum there. Woodrow Wilson was an evil, wicked coward and, coward and a disgrace to his father, out of Staunton, Virginia, who was a Presbyterian ministry. If you ever go to Staunton, Virginia, you can stop by that church building that his father used to minister in, and it's completely apostate. I was there. Next. And all amendments to the Federal Reserve Act, effectively abolishing the entire Federal Reserve System, the Federal Reserve Bank headquarters, that's called the, the, the um, out of the Banking Act that was passed, it's going to be the Board of Governors. Located in Washington, D.C., and all 12 of its regional banks located throughout the country. Amen. Get rid of the Federal Reserve. Got to go now. Cancel the illegal debt owed to the Federal Reserve by having the U.S. Congress pass and implement the Monetary Reform Act. This act would stabilize the economy and end the boom-bust economic cycles caused by fractional reserve banking. And you can go to www.themoneybasters.com and read more about it. Absolutely right. That's exactly right. Eliminate all paper money and restore the U.S. currency back to the use of gold, silver coins by having the U.S. Congress coin gold and silver coins through the Department of the Treasury for legal tender and all debts according to the Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution. That's Article 1, Section 8, Clause 10. No state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debt. That's right coined by that godly Presbyterian Calvinist Roger Sherman who signed all three major documents of our, of our country, the Constitution, Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence. 
and he was a great Connecticut statesman who championed hard money against paper money. And the book he wrote is called The Caveat Against Injustice. The caveat is gold and silver coin. The injustice is paper money. Okay? you got to read the book. And by the way, when F. Tupper Saucy republished that book many years ago, and I tend to think he was a Jesuit coadjutor, but he did a good thing, there were only two copies of this book that existed in the world. A caveat against injustice. you got to get it. Make a part of your library. Then Saucy wrote another book called Miracle on Main Street that's, that's fun to read, too. Get the caveat and read the miracle. Continuing. Repeal the 16th Amendment, federal income tax, and abolish the Internal Revenue Service. That's wonderful. The Internal Revenue Service was started in 1913. 16th Amendment, 1913. 17th Amendment, 1913. Federal Reserve Act, 1913. 1913 was a very good year, probably for the Council of 13 or the Illuminati in London. That's probably why they chose 1913. Right before they would ignite World War I in 1914 with the guns of August. 1915. Repeal the 17th Amendment, ending the direct election of U.S. Senators in each state. That's right. Our, we, we were, the Senators were to be chosen by the state governments because they were to represent the states, the sovereign nations. That's why little old Rhode Island would have two Senators and great big Texas has two Senators. They're both sovereign nation states in confederation together for limited purposes by way of the Constitution, which is a compact between sovereign states. And even Joseph Story will tell you that in his commentaries on the Constitution. Joseph Story, one of our greatest Supreme Court justices. Goes on. And restore the election of U.S. Senators by their state legislators according to Article 1, Section 3, Clause 1 and 2 of the U.S. Constitution. Amen. Now the states can be represented again. The states are represented in the Senate. The people are represented in the House of Representatives. That's how it's to work. And federal ownership of all federal lands and give it back to the American people through their respective states. Amen. Only federal ownership ought to be the District of Columbia. Other than that, they should, all the other land should belong to the states because all property is registered on a state level. <laughs> Pardon me. That means you've got to give back all these national parks given to the states. Theodore Roosevelt was a centralist. He was a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Freemason. He was an evil man. Rough Rider and Cuba are going to be make a hero out of him. Totally run by the Jesuit order. Abolish and eliminate the presidential cabinet departments of agriculture, commerce, education. Yeah, the Department of Commerce. Department of Education. God deliver us from the Department of Education. Department of Energy. God deliver us from that. We can have all our own you know, electromagnetic motors and we can all have de total decentralization of power with our electromagnetic motors, which are already perfected and ready to go into production. But the Jesuits and their CIA assassins and their mafia assassins will kill the, the ones who invent these and put them together because they want you, boy, they want you subject to their oil and their Middle Eastern oil so they can build the second Sunni caliphate with your money and jack the price of gas up to $5 a gallon that's going to go to the second Sunni caliphate with your money to build that wicked, sinful religion of Islam, which Luther called the kingdom of Satan, which you're paying for when you should be having electromagnetic motors running your house, and the only moving part is the, is the, is the center's piece uh, axle there. You put it in motion, it stays in motion. Woo! You're building in perpetual motion. I tell you what, this whole creation is perpetual motion. The sun moves, as the great black preacher in Virginia said, John Jasper. The sun do move. Get the book, The Life of John Jasper, from Sprinkle Publications. Read about that godly black man. White people used to come from miles around to hear him preach. Now he had a message called, The Sun Do Move. <laughs> the sun moves, the earth is at rest. And so, we don't need the Department of Energy, Education, Interior, Health, human, res human, human Services, Human Resources. Did you know you're a resource like a tree, you enemy belligerent, you U.S. citizen? Did you know that? They just treat you like you're a, a tree or, or some other resource. You're just a human resource. You're not a man. You're not a woman with a soul in their eyes. You're just a piece of paper. You're clothed with illegal fiction. You're just a human resource, boy. Homeland Security. 
Housing, homeland security. Are you kidding me? Why would anybody ever call this country the homeland? That's about, that's Russia, the motherland, the homeland. I think Hitler called Germany the homeland. Get rid of that word, homeland. What a sick term. This is America. These are the United States of America. My country, not my homeland. Homeland security, housing and urban development. That's all for the little little plantation for all the black folks in the major city. We, we just take them off the black plantation in the south and put them on the plantations of these urban development and we'll stack them into these big buildings in Chicago and other places. That's what we'll do. Yeah, so we can create all kinds of crime to justify martial law. Urban development. Department of Labor. The Department of Labor. God deliver us from that because you got the mafia involved in that with all their labor unions. The Roman Catholic Mafia, run by the Roman Catholic Mafia families <laughs> that are a bunch of rats and thieves and extorters and haters of God and servants of the Pope. And they're made men and they're assassins and they're armies that can only be dealt with by an army. They destroy individual manhood. Jimmy Hoffa and his labor and so on, then the head of the Teamsters, all sin, all of it. And Department of Transportation, do away with them all. Abolish, eliminate all federal law enforcement agencies that threaten and violate any individual's constitutionally protected rights, such as the Second Amendment, right to bear arms, and the Fourth Amendment search and seizure warrants. Hey, I don't care who's carrying a concealed weapon. I would just prefer to believe everybody is. Unless you're a convicted felon of some violent crime. Who cares? I don't care who's carrying a gun. And gun-carrying populations are, are law-abiding and they're more civil because you don't know when one guy wants to get tyrannical and start to hurt you, the other guy's going to pull a gun and shoot you. Which ought to happen. A gun-owning culture is a peaceful culture. Why do you think the Pope's taking away all the guns in Mexico? Why do you think Mexicans don't have handguns? Huh? They don't want those Mexicans to be able to stand against the tyranny of the Mexican government run by the Jesuits out of Mexico City. Every country that abolishes gun ownership is working for the Pope. And in my country, when I have my probat account, any congressman that gets them and says, you know what, well, I think we need to uh, confiscate these firearms, he immediately is going to be tried, accused of treason. He will be immediately put on trial in this House and Senate. And when he's convicted of that, they're going to take him right out to the wall that's right outside the building there and shoot him. No, we're not going to shoot him. That's an honorable death. We're going to hang him. And he can stay up there for a few days. What did he do? He advocated taking all our guns. <laughs> he got just exactly what he deserved. <laughs> Praise God and glory. Hallelujah. That's why Jesus Christ said, He that hath a no sword, let him sell it, his garment and buy one in the book of Luke. Jesus Christ talked about owning guns, owning weapons. You're going to need weapons when I'm absent here for a while. Gun ownership is a Protestant right. Catholics don't champion gun ownership that gave us the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is a Baptist, Calvinist, Presbyterian, Calvinist right. And all you Catholics that enjoy owning guns, you need to leave the Catholic Church and you need to find some Protestant or Baptist church somewhere and start going there and start reading the Bible if you want to keep your guns. And then he gives examples. BATF, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. What a sinful operation that is. And explosives, ATF, Drug Enforcement Agency, DEA. DEA just protects the big boys in their drug trading. They're not going after these drug importers and dealers in general. They work for the Pope, and they're going to protect the big boys like the ones in office, like the Bush cartel. <laughs> the Bush cartel is a whole lot bigger than the Medellin cartel. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, I call them the fornicating bastards of the Inquisition. That's what they are. The Federal Bureau of Inquisition is an inquisition, man. You read, get the book um, written by these two authors, J. Edgar Hoover and the American Inquisition by Theo Harris. Read, read it. Go get it. It's an inquisition for the military government. 
They covered up the Kennedy assassination. They covered up Bobby Kennedy assassination. They they facilitated the assassination of Malcolm X because Malcolm X had a had an advisor and he was a secret black man, secret advisor for the FBI as a black man. He was a traitor. FBI is not your friend. No matter how many FBI things they have on the TV, like Ephraim Zimmerlich Jr. and the FBI and portray J. Edgar Hoover as some great crime fighter. J. Edgar Hoover was a fag. He was a filthy, wicked, ungodly homosexual with his little homosexual partner there, Clyde Tolson. They were wicked sinners. And Hoover is a high Freemason, was a high Freemason, 33rd degree. He ran the FBI for 48 years for the Pope. He was a personal friend of Edmund Walsh out of Georgetown. Sin! Wicked! Papal! Papal government! Abolish and eliminate all other federal government agencies, bureaucracies that have no constitutional basis for existing. Examples, CDC. Well, you got Fauci there. CDC, EPA, FAA, FCC. Yeah, we're going to control all the communications now. FDA, the fornicating animal asses. The murderers, the FDA. And this American Murderers Association, the AMA, as that one particular... Uh, Alternative guy calls you Schultz. <laughs> he calls it the American Murderers Association. He's absolutely right. FEMA, FTC, NASA. Never a straight answer. NASA, NPS. By the way, all their approximations are done on a flat Earth at NASA, according to my friend Kevin Bauer, who used to work at NASA and pair personnel. And two of the scientists said, "Hey, Kevin, did you know that the Earth is flat?" Kevin said, "No, it's not. Yes, it is. We conduct all of our." All of what we do here at NASA on a flat Earth. Kevin's the one who gave me the book uh, Flat Earth Conspiracy by Eric Dubay. And I, I didn't believe a flat Earth at the time. And I said, well, I'll read it. After I got into the first hundred pages, I knew it was true. NASA knows it's true. They were never been, nobody's ever been to the moon. <laughs> it's not a planet. It emits light. I mean, everything they've ever taught us is a lie. And they use these three-letter agencies and all of them carrying guns. Got to have guns now. Got to intimidate you with my gun. Got to make you get down on your knees now, boy, because I might shoot you. NPS, NTSB, OSHA. OSHA, that's wonderful. We're going to have all these regulations so our American businessmen can't make a profit. And we're going to import all this trash out of China and wherever. But pennies on the dollar so the American people, pressed with for money, are going to go buy those things to further destroy our domestic manufacturers. Are we getting it yet? Close down all U.S. military bases around the world and immediately recall all active duty military personnel back home and have them repair and restore our country's infrastructure. That's exactly right. Shut them all down. Shut all the bases down. Every last one. I've said that for 30 years. I was garrisoned in Germany for three and a half years, and I'm thinking to myself, what are we here for? To fight the Russians? To make sure they don't... They're not coming in here. I worked in a nuclear weapons area, where, and also we went out to Victor Alert to pretend that we're blowing up the nuclear bombs on the F-4. This is all a game! Modernize, upgrade the U.S. power transmission grid infrastructure to withstand any type of foreign enemy EMP attacks against our country's electrical power grid system. You don't need a universal electrical power grid system. Take all those wires down. Take all those huge towers down. Have electromagnetic motors in all these places, all throughout the cities, to centralize, completely decentralize electrical power so we cannot be bombed. And by the way, while we're at it, we can do away with gas in the cities because all the gas lines in the cities, when they're bombed, are going to go up in flames and people are going to be burned alive. You can't have gas anymore in cities. That's got to go. Electromagnetic motors, that's all you need. Forget solar, it doesn't work. They know it works. What do you think powers their deep underground military bases, huh? They have, what, 120 deep underground military bases here? They're all, all using electromagnetic power. But that you can't have it, boy. We got it for us, but you can't have it now, boy. I want you to get what it feels like to be treated disrespectfully like you're a slave. I want you to know that's how they look upon you. Examples? Chinese, Russian, uh, Russian strategic EMP weapons systems. Well, you know how they got those? They got those from the military government of Washington. 
China doesn't have any technology without it being given to them from D.C. and Billy Boy Clinton. You get the book, The Year of the Rat, and it shows you how Clinton gave Red China all of our top military technology. Good old Jesuit educating Bill Clinton, who would not trade Jonathan Pollard for a spy, making sure Pollard gets to spend a full 30 years in prison for doing essentially no crime. Continuing, place the U.S. military and National Guard along the U.S. northern and southern borders to back up and support local law enforcement and the U.S. Border Patrol in ending stopping the illegal alien invader border crossings. That's right, brother. They're invaders. They're not immigrants. They're invaders. It's war. We're under invasion. We're under attack. And every preacher ought to be preaching his heart out about it. Today, on Sunday. And the U.S. Border Patrol in ending, stopping, alien invader crossings, drug trafficking, and foreign enemy combatants, drug cartels, and terrorists. Who do you think runs the drug cartels? Drug cartels are run by the FBI, this military government here. You know that Pablo Escobar in Colombia had a neighbor who was a CIA officer. Did you know that? The CIA is running those cartels. And there's even a movie that portrays it with Denzel Washington in it. I forget the name of the movie. Going on. Build a border fence. See the Hungarian-Polish border fences along the U.S. northern and southern borders. Canada and Mexico. Absolutely. Put that border fence up. You might as well electrify it too. You're not coming in here. <clears throat> but anybody that wants to leave, have at it. Go on. Go. Don't come back. Immediately deport all illegal alien invaders that have entered the U.S. illegally back to their country of origin. To do that, you're going to have to put the country on martial law for a while. But that's right. They all need to be rounded up and sent back. Who do they think they are coming to my country when they're coming in legally? Huh? And who defends them to come in illegally? It's the Pope. There's a great big statue of the Pope on the border. I think it's in Arizona. Welcoming all the Hispanic Roman Catholic alien invaders. that hate the gringos. If you're a white man, you're a gringo. And they hate you. And they want to take from you. And you owe them. And it's wrong. Reconquista. The reconquering of America. Immediately end foreign aid to all countries around the world. Absolutely, including Israel. Israel doesn't need any foreign aid. they got enough infrastructure there. They can have their own prosperity. Foreign aid is something the military government does. Not giving any foreign aid to anybody. There's plenty of wealthy Jews in this country that give their money to help Israel. And they, Israel's advanced enough to have their own uh, uh, technology. And you know what? Israel has to get rid of their Masonic Jewish labor Zionist government working for the Pope. Well, when you go get away with the American military government, that government in Israel will also fall. And they can, the Jews there can have somebody that will rule for their benefit finally. When they come under attack, they'll know about it. Their, their, their military won't stand idle for seven hours and allow the Muslim savages to kill a thousand Jews as they did in Gaza. That's all done by Netanyahu. Nitwit Yahu, the Jewish Freemason working for the Pope. Because they wanted that war. That wouldn't have happened without the military government here in D.C. overseeing it. Because Mossad is subject to the CIA. Mossad was built by Reinhard Galen, a Nazi, in 1951, according to John Loftus' work, The Secret War Against the Jews. Get it. Read it. Get informed. Immediately end U.S. participation with all treaties and threaten our nation's economy, national security, and national sovereignty. Yep. Examples, arms trade, comprehensive nuclear test ban, law of the sea, Paris Agreement, rights of a child, U.S. MCA, WHO, pandemic, etc. Immediately end U.S. membership and participation in all of the worldwide organizations that threaten our economy and national sovereignty. That's right. Examples, the G7 summit, well, that's run by the Jesuits. North Atlantic Alliance, well, that's NATO, run by the Jesuits. The World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization. That's right, it's got to go. All of that sin is going to go. Take back all land and industries in the U.S. that has been bought and taken over by a foreign country power. Example, China. That's right, we're taking it back. Can't have it anymore. No, you, you can't have it anymore now, Mr. Chinese. Can't have it. Nope. We know you hate us. But you, so we're kicking you out and we're taking our land back. Eliminate all government spy agencies of the U.S. intelligence community, including spy drones that threaten our individual freedoms, liberties, and right to privacy. We can have our own 
intelligence agencies in each one of our states. That's what we can have. Example, Central Intelligence Agency, the Catholics in Action, CIA, and National Security Agency, all, and, uh, totally run by the, the Archbishop in D.C., and all of the National Defense Intelligence Agencies, all 16 of them. Get rid of them all! Impeach, remove local, state, and federal judges that exceed or violate their constitutional authority oath as outlined in Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution or their respective local state constitutions. Yeah. You tell these judges, all of you are out. Not one of you ever dissented by sitting in your court with an emergency war powers military jurisdiction. Not one of you ever said anything about it. And the American people never knew it. And so now you're all gone. And the patriotic president can pick new judges for his civilian due process of law in our beautiful Article Three courts. With Article Three judges that are honest and don't condescend to us and don't call it their court. And don't treat us like trash, like Sylvia Rambo treated me like trash out of the Middle District of Pennsylvania here. And they named a new courthouse after her, that feminist wench. Impeach, remove all local, state, and federal prosecutors that threaten or violate any individual's constitutionally protected rights that are guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. Due process of law. Yeah, Civilian due process of law, not emergency war powers military due process of law. Uh-uh. No more of that sin. Examples. Fifth Amendment, rights to criminal cases. Sixth Amendment, rights to fair trial. Seventh Amendment, right to civil cases. And government censorship and control of the news media. Well, with the Emergency Banking Relief Act repealed, and there's no Trading with the Enemy Act inside the country, then there's no uh, ability or authorization to censor the news, because the Trading with the Enemy Act censors it. And when it was brought in land in 1933 with the Emergency Banking Relief Act, they get to go crazy with censorship. So CIA can be with every major daily in this country and make sure uh, that the people get just what we tell you to get now. No, 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 no. End government censorship, control of the news media, that's the internet, magazines, newspapers, radio, television, by restoring the press's constitutional protected First Amendment right to re report freely and independently of government control and thought. And anybody that, that does violence to a, a, a newsman, someone who's seeking to report the news like they, they violated those savages, what were they, Antifa beat up that Asian news guy, if you're going to beat up a guy that's doing that, we're going to take you out and we're going to hang you. You need to have some fear about suppressing freedom of reporting and freedom of conscience because when you want to pull that, you might as well say goodbye to this world because the foundation for a free republic, in addition to the word of God circulating freely, is a free press that is free to report. Anybody, the CIA killing people like Gary Webb and Danny Castellaro and these other guys, you want to kill these news guys that are telling the truth? Bye-bye. We're going to try you, we're going to convict you, and we're going to hang you. That's right. Going on, impeach, remove all local, state, federal government officials, congressmen, senators, state governors, state representatives, city mayors, city councilmen, county sheriffs that advocate, support, abolishing, or limiting any individual's constitutional rights, especially your right to own and bear arms. Next, restoring individuals and states' rights, restore and individuals and states' rights to back to their original intent and meaning. And it's outlined in Amendments, in Amendment 9, that's right, rights retained by the people, and Amendment 10, powers retained by the states and the people of the U.S. Constitution to protect them from any type of unconstitutional abuse of power from the federal government. Amen. We're going to go back to when we have citizenship, <clears throat> when the privileges and immunities of citizenship include the Bill of Rights. And we're going to take that slaughterhouse decision of 1873 and we're going to publicly burn it. When that decision of that radical red Republican court decided that the privileges and immunities of this new 14th Amendment national citizenship for whites and blacks both do not include the Bill of Rights, do not include fundamental rights, do not include common law rights. Later finalized and summarized in Twining versus New Jersey in 1908. Sorry, boy, your right to bear arms is not a privilege of citizenship that would limit our federal and state governments. That can't be a privilege of citizenship because we're going to take it away from you, boy. 
going on. Examples, First Amendment, freedom of religion, religion, speech, and press. Second Amendment, right to keep and bear arms. Next, restore an individual that states rights back to their original intent and meaning as outlined in the 9th and 10th Amendment. I just read that. And next, immediately end the U.S. government's war on climate change, the environment. Yeah, we're not going to have any more cloud seeding. We're not going to have any more manipulation of the, of the atmosphere because when you want to pull that, you just committed a capital offense. <laughs> and when you land, we'll be arresting you and finding out that you indeed seeded the clouds and you sprayed all this trash and this cancer-causing, immune-weakening stuff in the sky, and we're going to execute you. We're going to pull the weeds. That's right. What a delightful day that would be. I wonder about how many people have died because of all this weather manipulation, all that trash they put up in that atmosphere to manipulate and control the weather. Huh? With harp and all that other sin run by the Pope and his knights here. In weakening white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Western civilization. That's why they're doing it. Yes, and immediately end the U.S. government's war on climate change, the environment, crime, drugs, guns, Second Amendment, poverty, and terrorism. No more war on crime, no more war on drugs. The only war on crime, war on drugs, war on guns is you enforce the law. <laughs> and you either imprison them for a few years or you execute them. We're not sending anybody to jail for life. No, no. You commit a capital offense, we find you guilty. You're going to get executed. And what if we find anybody in government that facilitated this, we're going to execute them too. If they twisted the law, twisted the evidence, any prosecutor that twists the evidence and gets a guilty verdict for a capital crime, we're going to hang him too. So get ready to die, prosecutors. So the game is coming to an end. We're getting back to justice and punishing crime so the grass can grow. We've got to pull the weeds so the grass can grow. And all federal regulations and rules that interfere and weaken our nation's economic and activity and growth. That's right. Examples, auto industry, oil and natural gas industry, nuclear power energy. Well, we're not going to need nuclear power because, you see, the whole thing they pulled off at TMI was done deliberately. They shut off the water flow deliberately so it would heat up. You watch that special on Netflix. It's called, what was it? It's TMI. It's called Meltdown. Watch it. That guy deliberately shut down the flow of water over the coil so it would heat up. It was caused, so that was never going to happen again. So we don't need any central power with nuclear power. We need decentralization of power with electromagnetic motors. And that's one of the things I'm going to offer as a ministry of my church, which is my next great project before I die and go to be with the Lord. Next. Abolish all previous presidential executive orders, proclamations yeah, that have violated the use of the executive powers granted to the President of the United States as outlined in Article 2, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution. Examples, Presidential Proclamation 2039, 2040, and 2914. That's right. 2038 calls for an emergency session of Congress. So that was on Sunday. 2039 was Monday, March, March 6. 2040 was March 9th. Get rid of them all. Get rid of the have termination proclamations. Bye-bye. Going back to civilian government. And the Congress can immediately repeal the Emergency Banking Relief Act. So Trading with the Enemy Act is no longer inside the country. And in fact, we're going to repeal Trading with the Enemy Act because, you see, it was continued after World War I because there was no treaty. It was an armistice. It was a ceasefire. So the war was continuing. And that's why they kept Trading with the Enemy Act on the books and amended it some 14 times from 1918 to 1930, fashioning it and getting it ready to to implement the Emergency Banking Relief Act and the proclamations through the Trading with the Enemy Act. That's what they did. Did they teach you that in high school? Huh? Did they teach you that in college when they taught when they taught prob problems with democracy? Huh? They didn't teach you any of that. Because you're not supposed to know. You're supposed to be stupid. You're supposed to be dumbed down. You're not supposed to know anything. Just do what you're told, boy. Immediately have the U.S. Congress repeal all law regulations that violate any individual's personal freedoms and liberties that are protected by the U.S. Constitution and their state constitution. That's right. That's right. We can solve our own problems. We don't need the government to solve our problems. We can do it ourselves. As we read his words, seek the Lord, trust him, answers our prayers. We don't need. The government's supposed to be little and, and restrained and limited. 
doing only certain things we said it can do. The rest we'll do ourselves. And all the communists that want to advocate central power, we'll give them a ticket to any communist country they want to. But if you come back, we're going to execute you. Communism is a capital offense in my country, in this country. Communism is wicked, and it's just as bad as Islam. Alexander Solzhenitsyn said it ought to be a capital offense to be a communist, an atheist communist. Because he saw what that done to his country. He saw what a bunch of atheists did to Russia. All you atheists out there, ha, 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 you want to put us Bible-believing people down? Whatever did you ever establish? Let me show you. You got an atheistic Russia in the USSR. You got an atheistic China killed hundreds of millions of people. You get the book, The Black Book of Communism, written by those four authors. Get it. Read it. it said 175 million people were killed by communism in, in the 20th century. Thanks, atheists. You really did a good job. And you know who put those communist countries in power? Those atheists in Washington with a new deal, especially Franklin Dandable Roosevelt and all his new dealers. One of the things we're going to do after we do this, we're going to burn FDR in effigy, just like the English burned Guy Fawkes in effigy and every November 5th. We're going to burn FDR in every, uh, every what is it, uh, every, every March 9th, 1933. We're going to burn his him in effigy. Yeah, this is what he did. He's no hero. He didn't save the country. He's this traitor that was working for the Pope and the Jesuits of Georgetown, namely Edmund Walsh. And we'll burn Walsh in effigy too. Burn the Jesuit Edmund Walsh and FDR together as they're both hanging up. Their, their effigies are there and just burn them. Yeah. Of course, the Jesuits will be expelled by them, so there's nothing they can do about it. And they're going to want to come back, so we're going to have a special intelligence group group that will monitor any Jesuit re-entrance in the country. As soon as they come back, it's a capital offense. Bye-bye. That's what Cromwell did. Going on. The examples of this, the Espionage Act of 1917, Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917, Amen. Emergency Banking Act of 1933, amen. The National Firearms Act of 1934, amen. Who put that in place? The filthy New Dealers, the communists that they were. The first thing they did when Hitler comes to power is they sent him a congratulations. Congratulations, Adolf. You're now the head of the Nazi party and you're in power now in Germany. That's what the New Dealers did. The Jesuitical New Dealers, many of whom were Jews, serving the Pope, betraying their own people, so they could, so Jews could blame for all communism when the Jesuits are the masters of communism, perfected on their Paraguayan reductions for 150 years, from 1609 to 1759. No, the Jews are not the masters of it. Karl Marx was tutored when he wrote the Communist Manifesto by a Jesuit named Peter Bex, according to Bismarck. Going on, the Federal Firearms Act of 1938. Got to disarm all these heretics and liberals now. The Gun Control Act of 1968. The Gun Control Act was total sin put upon us after the assassination of JFK, uh, MLK, Malcolm X, and uh, all the four that were big assassins in the 60s. Well, we're going to control these guns now. We're going to know where they came from. We're going to know who makes them. And by God, we'll never have that happening. And there's more murder going around than you can imagine today with all this gun control. All they want to know is where the guns are. So when the Chinese invade, they go to the local county courthouse and they find all the firearms uh, permits issued. And they go right to those people's houses. You turn in your guns, we're going to kill you. Maybe they'll just kill you right outright and go in your house, take your guns. They want to know who has guns so they can come and take them away. That's the only purpose of gun registration. It's sin. National Defense Authorization Act. Yeah, that was read by, written by the Jesuits of Georgetown. The NDAA. They can charge you with a crime. They can arrest you, keep you in the pokey forever, put you in a dungeon, and as long as they don't charge you with a crime, that's where you're going to stay there now, boy. That's Catholic government. That's popish tyranny. USA Freedom Act of 2015. And then my dear friend who sent this to me, Brother Daniel, he says, always remember to refer to the United States of America as a constitutional republic and not a democracy. Amen, my brother. And I'm going to add one more thing. If this isn't done, then your state or your county needs to declare its independence. And when that's done, all of this is accomplished. 
And that's what I always advocate. Your state or your county needs to declare independence because Washington is unsalvageable. It's a papal city with all sorts of papal build, and papal symbols and papal monuments. It's Rome and the Potomac. As Justin Fulton wrote in his great work, Washington in the Lap of Rome in 1888. So in conclusion, you born-again, Bible-believing men of God, specifically you white men who are Protestant, Baptists, and Calvinists, live up to your heritage of bearing the sword of just defense through the arm of government and either clean this up, like Brother Daniel has said, or just make it easy and declare independence on a state or county level and get ready to go because you're going to be invaded by somebody or attacked by somebody. But if you're trusting the Lord, you'll be safe. You're going to do right, and He will bless righteousness as he always does my Sunday sermon may the Lord bless you as you do his will according to his will but may you read his word and do his will according to his word the AV 1611 Reformation English Bible so until next time Lord bless Brother Eric John Phelps 24-7 World Radio Maranatha